All right, I wanted to introduce Art Hirsch. He is a former environmental consultant and an expert in water quality, stormwater management, sustainability, and environmental impact assessments. Originally from Michigan, he now lives in Boulder, Colorado and spends his summers in Pentwater, Michigan. Art has been a trained climate reality leader for the past three years and is a member of the Western Michigan chapter. So we wanted to um, welcome you, Art, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Take it away. Great. Great. Well, well thank you very much, um, Natalie. Uh, thanks a lot for the, uh, the introduction. Um, and I want to say hello to the Chicago uh, Metro chapter. Uh, it's the first time I've had a chance to meet you. So uh, uh, nice to meet you all and thanks a lot for showing up. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Jane, uh, Cynthia, Natalie, and Jennifer, and others who've been involved with coordinating uh, this, this presentation. So thank you. Uh, and I want to thank all of you who, uh, as attendees, uh, for being here tonight. Uh, on this very important water quality uh, issue in the Great Lakes and really most everywhere on the planet. Uh, the issue is microplastics. I know that you have a choice in being here and watching this presentation and me, uh, or you could be uh, watching the Olympics. So uh, I really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate your interest uh, uh, in this particular subject, so thank you. Uh, as, as already mentioned, I'm a former environmental engineering consultant. I live in Pentwater, uh, Michigan, and also in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I get involved with uh, various types of projects and activities. Um, I've been involved with um, climate change. I got my uh, leadership in April of 2021. And uh, the type of projects that I'm working on other than microplastics uh, is the Line 5 oil pipeline shutdown, uh, oil and gas emissions, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, mostly here in Colorado, uh, and also transportation uh, emissions and reductions. So those are the other things I get involved with. So this presentation, the purpose of it is, is to really to increase your awareness and interest in the uh, emerging water quality problem facing uh, Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes. The Great Lakes contains over 20% of the limited fresh water that's here on the planet. There's little or no action of being taken by federal, state, or even the International Joint Commission to really address the microplastics issue. Therefore, this issue warrants our attention and our, and our prote uh, protection. My goal is to have, have you know much better understanding about what microplastics are, their sources, and their potential impacts uh, to the environment and to the public health. And I want you, and that you, I want you to be concerned about and take action about what's happening in the Great Lakes. My main themes in the talk are three. One is that microplastics represent a risk to the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of uh, the Great Lakes. Two, more research and money is needed to understand the environmental risks, impact and sources, loading and transport of microplastics throughout the entire Great Lakes to really understand and be able to manage them. Three, microplastics in the Great Lakes is difficult. It's a complex problem, both technically and politically. So, uh, so with that introduction, uh, I wanted to mention something before I get started, is that uh, I have a satellite dish, uh, Hughes satellite, uh, because I live up in the foothills of Boulder, and there's going to be a lag time uh, between probably what I'm saying and probably when the, uh, the pictures show up from the PowerPoint presentation. So I apologize, so please bear with me if it's just a little bit awkward, okay? Um, the first, the first slide here is uh, the abuse of Lake Michigan in the past 68 years. Uh, I've lived on Lake Michigan all my life. I'm from the state of Michigan. Um, I got my degrees from Michigan, uh, my bachelor's degree in Michigan, and my uh, engineering degree in, in, in Colorado. 
but uh, I've always lived on the lake. And for 68 years, that, that's how old I am. And so I've seen this, I've seen the abuse. Uh, you know, early on in the 70s, there was raw sewage dumped in Lake, lake Michigan, heavy metals, Gary, Indiana, uh, Waukegan, you know, before the Clean Water Act was actually initiated, uh, the, the lake was being abused at that time. And then we start getting into the phosphorus detergent issue, uh, which you know, algae in the lake just exploded, uh, in which luckily there were controls put on the use of phosphorus in terms of detergents. PCBs from transformers were put into the lake. Uh, and then we got the invasive species that have had a huge impact on the productivity of the lake from alewife to mussels to aquatic plants. Uh, combined street, uh, sewer overflow conditions, uh, primarily out of the huge metropolitan areas adjacent to the lake. Now we've got issues about forever chemicals that are in the lake uh, that are actually being taken into the tissues of fish uh, in Lake Michigan. So again, just another issue. And then we add plastics and microplastics to the, to the, to the issues. So this is kind of, this is kind of the list of things that have happened in Lake Michigan, and it really deserves much better than how we've been treating it for the past 68 years. So when people think about plastics, they think about plastics in water. Uh, I think a lot of people still think about these gyres. Uh, basically, gyre is just basically a circulation uh, of water. Uh, in various locations throughout the oceans here. Uh, it's basically generated from the rotation of the earth. So if he's got these circulation patterns, and what happens is all the, the trash, debris, plastic materials uh, that come from other countries get wrapped up into the rotation of these, um, of these gyres. And so what happens is you end up with something that just looks disgustingly bad uh, in regards to the accumulation of plastic in, in terms of the depth, but also the, uh, the spatial extent uh, of the plastics. You know, uh, the North, the North Geyer has got uh, 617 square miles of plastic material that is floating into the ocean. So I think that's what a lot of people think of, but you know, there's kind of similar to that situation uh, in, in the Great Lakes. Uh, if you look at this, uh, Hopefully you're in this, uh, the lag time this isn't too bad. Uh, the next slide is really the circulation uh, of the Great Lakes. And you can see these, these patterns uh, along Lake Michigan area. Uh, usually the Great Lakes have got a counterclockwise rotation, uh, the larger ones. And uh, we'll pick on Lake Michigan here. You can see the lower part uh, of Lake Michigan has got the circular pattern, uh, not a whole lot of flow coming in it's really almost like a closed basin to a certain extent with the lower part of the lake. Uh, we've got a similar situation here in the upper part of, of Lake Michigan. Uh, you can see it in Lake Erie, you can see the circulation patterns and in Lake Ontario. So again, we can kind of think of them as, as, as these gyres creating these circulation patterns. But then you look at the particle density and they really follow these, these uh, rotational uh, circular patterns that I was bringing up. Um, the yellow is really the high high intensity particle uh, uh, distribution in the lake. And this is microplastics and plastics. And the yellow being the highest. And you can see it's not surprising. You see the highest concentrations of plastic material in the very southern part uh, of Lake Michigan because it's so, in, it's, in, it's influenced, oops, it's influenced by large metropolitan areas and also by, again, the circulation patterns. You can also see it also in Lake Erie, where it gets near the Detroit area, the Cleveland area, and in Lake Ontario being influenced by, by Ontario, Canada. So it kind of gives you a sense of the, the distribution pattern of the plastics, again, and how it is related to the, uh, the, yeah, the circulation and discharge patterns uh, throughout the area. So talking about plastics, this is, it's, this is a, a very complex issue. Uh, it, it's hard to 
stay away from plastics. It's ingrained in our in our and how we live in many ways. Uh, it's it's ingrained in terms of like purchase use plastic is using in terms of how we buy food. Uh, is it uh, covered with plastic vegetables as opposed to going to a farmer's market, uh, which all of us don't have that opportunity. Uh, Plastic is used a lot for covering a lot of food items and, and, veg, and vegetables. Um, over on the, the top left, you see these, these single use plastic bags in grocery stores and retail stores that people use instead of bringing their own bags, they end up getting plastic bags. They maybe use them for maybe a half hour or so until they get home and they throw them away. Uh, again, a problem. With plastic materials and how this are used in our throwaway society, so to speak. But not all plastics are bad. Um, you know, we need them for medical purposes. Uh, we need them for automotive purposes to make our cars very light so they get great miles per gallon. Um, and also, you can see that there's a lot of issues in regards to containers, uh, water bottles, styrofoam. So, my point is here it's so ingrained into our society and our quality of life, that it's very difficult to be able to sort this stuff out and actually to stop the use of plastics entirely. So let's get down to really what plastics are. I think we all kind of get a feel for it. Uh, you know, it's really a, a wide range of synthetic and semi-synthetic materials that are made out of uh, natural products such as coal, natural gas and crude oil. It's basically a linear, it's a linear um, uh, extension, if you will, uh, of carbon atoms, carbon atoms play side by side by side by side in making these really long, um, these long uh, pla uh, plasticized type materials that are strong and they're lightweight. And that's what makes us, that's what makes plastics so attractive uh, especially to uh, to companies is because they are so strong and being in and in, in very light. So plastics, forty percent are used for packaging, thirty percent for construction. Uh, this would be uh, primarily uh, materials such as flooring, insulation, surprisingly. Beverage containers, ten percent, and then others are about twenty percent. So it kind of gives you a sense for the plastic materials and. And this slide here, this, uh, this table, really just exemplifies the, the type of uh, plastic that we come in contact with and we use a lot that are really is the beginning materials for the microplastics. You know, the, the, the polypropyl polyethylenes, a low density and high density for bubble wrap, milk containers, food wraps, uh, polyester for fibers. Uh, water bottles made out of PET, uh, polypropylene for bottles, straws, packaging, um, polyvinyl chloride for flooring, piping, siding, those sort of things. So these are the common ones. There, there's hundreds of other types of polymers, uh, but these are the ones that are most used and really cause the problems associated with the development of microplastics. So this, this graph here, is the uh, actual generation of waste, plastic waste uh, on a global scale. Um, the the y-axis is a uh, cumulative, it's metric, million metric tons of plastic uh, waste generated. And then the bottom here is the time scale. A uh, couple things to note here. Just look at this curve. You look at this curve going up from, two, from where we are right now 2220, uh, excuse me, 2022, all the way up to 2050, there's going to be almost a threefold increase in the amount of plastic that's going to be manufactured and the amount of waste that's going to be generated associated with that. So this plastic issue is not going away soon. It's going to continue to increase uh, in quantity uh, and in waste. Uh, the next thing is that um, by 2025, there, uh, there's going to be an additional 55 million tons of CO2 or greenhouse gases from 42 new electric plastic plants uh, worldwide. So that's equivalent to 27 coal-fired power plants. 
So the theme here is really that um, plastic manufacturing is intensive, it's energy intensive, and it's greenhouse gas emission intensive. And it's, and it's again, we're gonna have a problem in terms of controlling these, these emissions. Uh, in 2030, uh, oil demand, the current oil demand is gonna be related to plastics, 33%. And 50% of the oil demand by 2050 is going to be related to plastics. So again, more and more fossil fuels that normally would go into cars and other applications are going to be brought in to the manufacturing of plastics. So I could talk all day on this particular graph. Uh, I'll move on. What are the characteristics of plastics as the additives? And the additives are put in because it makes them they have different type of um, structural requirements, you know, in terms of uh, if they wanted to make them more flexible, they wanted to put coloring in them, uh, they make them more resilient. Uh, they put plastic additives uh, in the plastics during the, during the manufacturing. The trouble is, is that many of these uh, additives are called endocrine disruptors uh, and they're really chemicals that affect uh, and are toxic to reproduction which means they create problems with fertility uh, and also even in unborn children. And so these are the types of plastic these materials are in plastics and that they do leach out of the plastics. Um, so we've got uh, BBPA, uh, which is inside water pipes and cans, inside the cans of food that we purchase off of the shelves. Uh, we use this type of additive because it adds to the shelf life of some of the foods that we buy. Uh, phthalates are softeners, which you're able to, to, to bend and mold them. Um, and, and alkali phenols, uh, which basically make fragrances, thermoplastic isomers, antioxidants, and fire retardant materials. So this is the stuff that's in the plastics. There's also fire retardant materials in plastics. Uh, one of particular interest is the PFAS, uh, which is a forever chemical uh, that currently having problems within the Great Lakes. So this kind of gives you a, a thumbnail sketch here of really some of the additives and some of the toxicity associated with it. And as a, and as a, um, a side note, is that it was noted by, uh, that, 40, that fertility rates in males primarily in the United States have decreased 30% over the past 35 years. So you, one kind of wonders, is it, is it because of our exposure to plastics uh, and other types of chemicals that we're totally exposed to uh, as we live our lives? So I'll move on. So how much plastic gets loaded into the Great Lakes? Well, there's a lot. 22 million pounds of plastic uh, gets, it gets put into the Great Lakes per year. You know, that's an enormous amount of plastic material. Uh, Lake Michigan is number one uh, with 11, mil uh, 11 million pounds per year, followed by Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So uh, a lot of the plastics that we see on the beaches, 80%, a lot of the, excuse me, a lot of the litter that we see is mostly plastic associated with a lot of large cities that I mentioned before, Chicago, Toronto, and Cleveland, uh, in Detroit. So it kind of gives you a sense of the huge amount of loading that Lake Michigan receives uh, uh, in regards to um, plastic materials. So when we say microplastics, you know, what are we talking about? Well, it's really materials, plastic material that's less than five millimeters in size. That's the definition. So that's about three sixteenths of an inch. So you can see from this picture, you know, there's a lot of microplastics in there. You could easily see many types of size fractions uh, of microplastics. So even if you just walk around the beach, you can see this. So there's two types of microplastics. One is called primary. And really what that is, it's basically plastic yeah. material that was manufactured le less than five millimeters. I do. So that was basically made for a particular reason. Uh, so it's products such as nurdles, uh, which are, are pre-plastic materials that I'll talk about a little bit later. 
uh, microbeads that used to be into cosmetics, uh, toothpaste. Uh, there are microbeads inside detergents like Tide. Uh, they're called primary microplastics. And there's also microbeads that are used for industrial purposes to remove rust, uh, paint, uh, boiler reconditioning, et cetera, in an industrial setting. So those are the primary ones. Secondary uh, microplastics are really the problem that we've got uh, in the water, uh, in addition to the primary ones. But these come from, basically, it's a degradation of large pieces of plastic that make the secondary, ultimately to make, making them less than five millimeters. And the plastic, the primary plastic materials get beaten down, broken down by the sun, abrasion, wave action uh, into uh, micro, micro sizes. So it just gets beaten down further and further and further in size. Uh, another type of nanoplastic that can be either primary or secondary are nano. Uh, these are like, these are microns uh, in terms of size, which you just can't see. But these are the ones that have a high risk to them because they're easily ingested by fish. It actually settle uh, into uh, the muscles uh, of, the, of the, fish, uh, the fish species. So there's, there's five different types of microplastics. Um, there's the fragments that, again, that I showed in the previous picture, and we've seen probably on the beaches. Uh, then we have the pellets. Again, those nurdle type materials, very cylindrical. Type materials. Uh, I'm sure if, hope, I wasn't sure if some of you have seen these types of materials. I have on my beach. And then we start seeing them in films, film type uh, microplastics. So you could think of these as coming off of like plastic potato chip bags, uh, that type of material that's like thin sheets uh, that get caught into the water. Uh, there's foam, such as styrofoam material, uh, is another component. And then there's microfibers. Uh, we're going to talk about, a lot about microfibers here in this presentation. This kind of some what they look like. These are the microfibers. This is really what comes off of our clothes. Um, and you can see that it's very stringy type material uh, that is, uh, many times you can't see these. Uh, they're, again, less than five millimeters, but you just can't easily see them with the naked eye. Sometimes you can see these, uh, the fragments here on the bottom right, fragment, um, microplastics, uh, again, just beaten up bottles, uh, pipes, et cetera, into these plastic type chip materials. So those are probably the two major size fractions that we see both in the tributaries and also in the main lakes of the Great Lakes. So this is data from the uh, United States Geological Service. They went out and sampled uh, 26 tributaries that lead into the Great Lakes. And by far the biggest type of, micro, of microplastic uh, that, that they found and identified uh, in these tributaries are microfibers. Uh, again, synthetic materials coming off of clothes primarily. Then we've got the fragments that I showed you a picture of this before. And then we get into the foams, films, and beads, but you can kind of see their relative uh, percentages. Uh, but again, fibers and fragments make up the major part uh, of the microplastics in the Great Lakes. So is the microfibers gonna go away? Uh, is the use of uh, polyester synthetic clothes gonna go away? You know, I, I saw this graph and I was really bummed out because <laughs> my ski clothes are all synthetic. You know, a lot of my athletic wear is synthetic. You know, and so I've got a few cotton and wool pieces, but uh, Gore-Tex, those types of materials. This is that, so. This is the type of trend that we're seeing. It's going to continue to increase in terms of how the type of clothing that we use. Uh, and choose to use. So uh, hopefully we'll start to see more and more use of cotton and wool uh, in the future and less polyester. So I'm gonna talk about sources and I'm gonna to try to go relatively fast about the sources. 
and uh, and some of these are, are it's really hard to prioritize which is one over the other. And this is an area that needs a lot of research in terms of looking at sources, looking at different loads, uh, quantities, et cetera, and how they are basically impact uh, the overall lake. Uh, kind of what you would think of is like a wastewater treatment plant that accepts domestic uh, wastewater and also in some towns, uh, storm sewer uh, material uh, goes into a wastewater treatment plant. So just inherently, you think that there's a lot of plastics that come in and come out uh, of a wastewater treatment plant system. Um, industrial discharges uh, is another source, you know, from cleaning boilers in, elect in electrical facilities, um, paint, detergents, et cetera, coming out of industrial processes, uh, also as a, as a is a source of microplastics. We start getting into again washing of clothes, uh, microfibers from washing synthetic clothes, and it's they're huge, seven hundred thousand fibers per load. Now this was astonishing when I started to do the research, and um, so we've got that potential. We've got this problem here of a special source just from washing our clothes and also drying our clothes. Uh, is also another source. It's more of an air emission issue of plastics as opposed to an aquatic. Uh, we have tide. We have various types of all detergent materials, 2.5 million microbeads per laundry load. It's huge. So who would have, I, I thought that these were basically banned back in the day, but Congress, and they took them out of the cosmetics, the microbeads, did not take them out of the detergents. So it's a, still a source of, uh, of microplastics. Um, beach litter. Uh, yes, we've all seen this uh, as a problem uh, with sources. Tire car, uh, tires from cars and trucks. Uh, the tire uh, tread just gets beaten down uh, year after year and it's deposited on the pavement material. And ultimately, when it rains or it snows, it gets put into a storm sewer system. It ultimately ends up uh, into the tributaries and into the lakes. I'm going to pick on agriculture just a little bit uh, because it's a high source, potentially a high source uh, of microplastics. And you kind of wonder, like, well, what does my agriculture got to do with this? Well, agriculture uses fertilizer from wastewater treatment plants. Um, you know, from the uh, activated sludge material that's collected uh, during the wastewater treatment system, it's dried, it's transported over to farmers' fields, and ultimately placed down on them for fertilizer application, which is great. A lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus in here. The problem is they're loaded with microplastics all through here. So the, the, what has to happen is that with these, there has to be stormwater runoff controls. So when the water hits this material, it just doesn't go into a ditch and ultimately into a tributary. So this is a, a lot of research is being done in this United Kingdom primarily, but also in the United States, uh, because you know close to 60% of the wastewater treatment systems in the United States use this type of way to get rid of their biosolids is on the agricultural fields. Uh, another agricultural source is plastic mulch, especially for specialty crops like vegetables, strawberries, et cetera, uh, where they actually lay down these tarps of, uh, of micro of plastic material. And uh, usually it's about 230 pounds per acre of plastic mulch that's applied uh, for this, uh, ag this agricultural application. So the problem is, is that the end of the growing season, what do you do with it? You know, so a lot of people, uh, farmers, they try to landfill it, uh, but that costs money to transport it. So a lot of times they'll just let it sit or they'll burn it. And when that's burned, not only does it release a greenhouse gas, but also cr creates a lot of fragmentation of the plastic material that again, that can get into the ditches and contributors. Uh, even uh, seed, and fertilizer that's applied for crops 
uh, is encapsulated with plastic. They're almost like, at least with a fertilizer, it's almost like a, a slow release aspirin uh, that's released. Now nutrients are released uh, a little bit at a time uh, to promote growth of the crops. Uh, another source is the wastewater uh, wastewater treatments, excuse me, the wastewater systems, storm sewer systems, but also tributary uh, trash and material that we all unfortunately have seen uh, this, uh, this type of scene that ultimately ends up into tributaries and into lakes. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about these nurdles, these cylindrical materials. And these are made by fossil fuel manufacturers. And they're basically plastic material in here. So in other words, this, these nurdles are brought over to a plastic manufacturer. They're heated and they're jet molded to create whatever type of plastic material that one desires. But this is originally what the plastic material looks like before it goes into an injection. Uh, so the, the nurdle material, uh, it's manufactured and it's shipped and then it's stored, and then it goes through some sort of a process manufacturing process. And all through this, this stuff can get spilled uh, directly into the lake or into the storm sewer systems that get into the lake. So these are a real problem uh, in regards to uh, the, the abundance on beaches, uh, which is 70% of the beaches in all five Great Lakes have experienced these, such as my beach. And um, they're, they're toxic, the toxic materials. Now I'll talk about them a little bit later here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about ecological impacts now. And again, as I mentioned before, this, this is a complex issue and I'm not gonna go through this chart, um, but I just wanted to show you the complexity, the decisions, the research, the questions that need to be answered to really start identifying uh, the organism interaction with micro microplastics and what the potential impacts are, not only to the aquatic system, but also to the human health. So again, not a trivial exercise in trying to figure this out. A little bit about environmental impacts. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about these. I've just picked out a few of them. There's numerous ones in the literature. Um, I think one of the things that was most startling to me as I started getting into the microplastics type research and work and interest is how much plastic we consume per day, excuse me, per week. That actually, the average person in the United States, you know, we consume, we take in, we ingest five grams uh, per week per person. So it doesn't sound like much maybe, but five grams is close to the, to the weight of a credit card per week. So a lot of that plastic comes from food. Most of it comes from water and, and some of it comes from the air that we breathe. And also in regards to human impacts, uh, it's, it has actually gotten into the placentas or actually has gone through the placentas uh, gone into the actually the infant uh, uh, macromium. Uh, so, in, so that's a real disturbing issue of how abundant these are. Uh, I talked about the endocrine disruptors before. Uh, food chain consumption, we, we basically consume fish that has got plastic in them and ultimately we ingest them. Uh, the ecological impacts are going to some toxics that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, fish can mistaken uh, microplastics for food, uh, like those nurdles that I was showing you, uh, and they ultimately die of starvation. Uh, chain food, uh, food chain, biomagnification issues with plastics, and also reproduction uh, reductions. So again, the theme here, a lot more research needs to be done uh, in terms of the human and the, and the ecological impacts. So this is kind of, in this next picture, it's just kind of showing you the leaching and the absorption of various types of chemicals. Uh, so pretend this, this particular brown area here is a, is a microplastic. Uh, it has the phthalates, it has the various types of additives. What research has shown is this material is leached out into the water. 
once it becomes put into the water and has a time to start stabilizing in the water column, uh, there's a, a leaching uh, effect. But at the same time, depending upon the surface area of the uh, microplastic, it can be uh, like a, it, it can uh, absorb uh, and be kind of like a vector for various types of pollutants to jump onto, uh, such as PCBs, DDTs, a lot of herbicide materials that still reside in the water column can jump onto these. And again, if this material is uh, taken in through a fish or human, we've got these types of materials that uh, lead to some sort of body burden. Again, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Are these leached materials, are they are concentrations high enough to create a significant impact? That's the question that needs to be answered. This is an example of a fish mistaking the um, uh, microplastics uh, as food. Uh, so we've got this type of a situation here. And ultimately, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of them end up starving. Uh, once that they're in the stomachs and they cannot expel this particular material. And also the nanomaterials get into the, actually into the muscle type uh, of the fish that ultimately we consume as humans. Uh, this will give you an example of those nurdles uh, of being ingested uh, by fish, uh, mistaking it for food. So how do we how do we start controlling these? And this is a these are really simplistic lists. I mean, I, again, I could talk on each one of these in, in much more detail than I have time to tonight. But um, the, the, one of the themes, the takeaway, if you will from the presentation in many respects, it's difficult to impossible to ever remediate a microplastic that's released into the environment. There's just no way, they're too small, there's too many of them. You haven't got a filter press big enough to be able to collect it and filter it out. So once it's in the environment, it's there in the environment. Um, other controls that could be done is agricultural controls, best practices, trying to control that stormwater. Um, industrial controls is try to stop uh, a lot of the material being discharged out into the lakes. Um, the uh, use of um, uh, controlling these pellets, if you will, these nurdles, stormwater management, uh, stopping it from going into the drains and into the tributaries. Stop human littering on the beach, you no know, smoking. There's just a lot of uh, secondary uh, microplastics that are developed just because of the wave action and the uh, erosion of uh, abrasion and the sun that occurs near the beach area. So this is a potentially a significant source area. Uh, we can improve wastewater treatment systems. And the last one here I got is source control, uh, stopping the use uh, and manufacturing of plastics. Not totally, but how do you control it? You know, right now there's it's, there is no controls, uh, and so this is this is probably the biggest issue here is how to control that source. So I'm going to call them upstream controls. In other words, like this is uh, related to more of the micro microfibers. Um, one of the things to look at looking at in the Panagonia is really being uh, very aggressive on this. They're starting to look at material substitution. Uh, looking at more natural fiber materials, uh, biogradable materials, uh, or non-shedding fabrics that can be used instead of the synthetic-based uh, clothing. Um, next one is different type of washing machines where there are integrated uh, filter systems inside these. And here's the picture of it, where you get the, the, mach the machine here, and then incorporate inside of it is kind of a filter cylinder. <coughs> Excuse me. A filter cylinder that's incorporated, it's changed out at a certain frequency. So this is something that uh, the United Kingdom is really, really looking at seriously, uh, putting in place, uh, and along with uh, with France. Uh, the the mach machine is called the Grundig Integrated Filter System. There's also these little core balls that you can throw into your wash, and it will it will collect some. Uh, the, the microfibers, but only about 30% uh, from the literature I've been seeing where the, the Grundig 
filter system is like 90% removal, which is pretty high. Um, when, but I also mentioned that there's regulations that are being um, considered by France, United Kingdom, and not surprisingly, uh, California is looking at some sort of regulation. So I talked about these wastewater treatment plants before and uh, where a lot of the plastic material comes into them. And what's surprising is that these wastewater treatment plants are extremely efficient in terms of removing plastics. Um, if you just have primary treatment, that's about 57% uh, removal just by settling. And then you have biological treatment, which is a cat, which is in this next series to that. It's generally about 16%. So we get set a total of 73% plastic removal with these two systems in the series. And then if you add a tertiary system on top of that, that gets you to about 90% removal plus. So it's really surprising how well uh, this system works in terms of uh, mass microplastic removal. But that's why there's so much plastic inside those biosolids that I talked about before. Nurdle control, that's really simple. It's just basically good housekeeping by industry, these plastic manufacturers that really be able to collect spilled material um, and, and being able to properly dispose of it, deploy training, best practices. It's pretty straightforward in terms of this type of material. I'm going to get to do a little bit about regulations really quickly. Um, there's the NURDA law that uh, was developed by California. They recognized the fact that um, this was NURDLs were an issue in regards to fish, human consumption, et cetera. So Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the first NURDL law, basically requiring NURDLs to be controlled uh, under their clean water. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin from uh, your state of Illinois uh, has got supposed, uh, proposed a Plastic Free Waters Act to really deal with, uh, with um, these, these types of plastic myrtle pellets. Uh, again, under the Clean Water Act, pretty similar to what California did. Uh, this legislation is still pending uh, in Congress, and I hope it does get some, some traction in the future. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this particular law, the, the Break Free Plastics Pollution Act uh, by Senator uh, by Representatives Lowenthal, Clark, and Murphy. Uh, this is the home run ball dealing with recycling, manufacturing of plastics, uh, reduction of toxics, uh, removal of microplastics. Uh, this is a huge, huge bill that still is pending in Congress. So I'm getting closer to the end here. Um, these are kind of like big picture recommendations uh, of the Great Lakes. And a lot of it deals with a lot of research and political communication. I think a lot of political leaders don't have a clue of what's going on in the Great Lakes related to microplastics and the risks. Uh, basically provide money for research, uh, disseminate information to the public so they understand what's going on. Um, understanding the, the human and ecological risks associated with microplastics and fake transport models to understand the movement of microplastics. Um, so what, you, what can you and I do? And so this is kind of, I think we're going to be talking a little bit about this uh, at the end of the presentation during the breakout groups, but you know, what can you do? And there's several things you can do as activists. We know a lot of these we're contacting your representatives, voting for uh, environmental candidates. Um, there's just personal decisions about our use on plastic, uh, source control. And one of the themes here is that one of the things is recycling. Recycling will not get us out of this plastic problem. Okay, that's in the summary. That's kind of the crux of the whole thing. Uh, they need to be source control. Uh, they represent a risk. There's, there's complex sources. Um, in these research, toxic materials are present potentially at, at a high risk. Um, there's no regulations uh, that control these microplastics. Um, 
there's not there's going to be numerous controls are going to be needed to ultimately get our arms around it so no one control mechanism is going to work it's not a silver bullet and finally we need to address this emergent uh, pollutant in the great lakes <coughs> so this is just a list of uh, references that i've used I find them very helpful so um Chicago Metro chapter has a copy of the PDF that I use in this presentation. So if you're at all interested in getting a copy of the presentation and, and want to look at these references, uh, by all means, they're very helpful. So that's uh, the presentation. And so uh, I hope it was uh, informative. I hope you learned a lot about microplastics. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art. That was amazing. Um, really good. Do you want to unshare your screen while I think about it? I'd like to get a screenshot of everybody before they go into the breakout groups. See if I can get out of here. Am I still there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Everybody smile. Okay, and we've got another and another one. Everybody smile. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> one more screen chat. Thank you, Sid. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Natalie. Okay, um, so now we're going to go into um, our breakout sessions where we have two questions that we will be discussing and then bringing our answers back to the table. So, um, Jennifer, if you want to put us into breakouts. Well, actually, one thing, I mean, were we able to ask questions of the presentation or we just go into, I'm new here, by the way, you haven't seen my name. My name is Wayne. I'm talking. Um, so uh, there were some questions that I had and um... good. <laughs> yeah, I think we could take one or two questions, but then we need to move to the breakouts. Okay, I'll do this really quick. There's like, I put a bunch of them in okay, the chat well, because no normally we go through the chat and ask, you know, on most presentations that I do. So um, I guess probably the most important important question to a, one of the studies that are done on personal behavior, like on climate change, when you look at carbon dioxide, there's some studies that say if we change, you know, our behaviors, we're actually making a dent in the, in our um, greenhouse gas potential emissions. Do you see any studies that show personal behavior changes um, that will make a dent in this just from our own adaptation in an academic sense, not in a practical sense, but in an academic sense. Yeah, you know, I, that's a great, I really like that question. Uh, the answer, I haven't seen that as of yet, uh, any serious studies uh, being able to, to forecast if you change a certain behavior, um, like avoiding single use bags, for instance, it's going to lead to X reduction of, of impact. So, you, you know, I, I, I think the science is, is not there yet, being able to determine what the relationship is between personal choices uh, and, um, and things that you can do versus the amount of actual quantifying a particular impact. Uh, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does. It, it's very much so. Yeah. Because there's a lot of different yeah, things that can be we can make choices on. The other question that I had that kind of co collects with that is is the uh, you know now there's hemp and there's um, bamboo and all these other things, but they're made in a very similar um, way, organic uh, syn synthesis as as the oil. So do they actually break down faster or are they the same uh, because of their their kind of rayon type of um manufacturing no you know I, I don't i don't know the answer to that in terms of the longevity of it you know i know that there's uh several 
uh, new companies that have come online that are looking more at the natural fibers of things. And so I would think that they're, they're going to make money. Uh, they're going to have to have some sort of resiliency to them, uh, to the fibers. Um, and so and, and the duration of them, obviously. So um, obviously there's going to be something you manufacture something like that, that type of a fiber material. You know, there's other chemicals that are associated with that, you know, so it's not going to be probably totally 100% environmentally clean, but it can be managed uh, as opposed to using a synthetic material, um, which creates the microplastic problem. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Natalie. Okay, um, so I think we're ready for the uh, breakout rooms.